Okay, good morning. We're going to talk a little bit about chest radiography. I know you guys already know a lot about chest radiography, but we're going to cover some of the basics of looking at these x-rays and determining because pretty soon it's going to be time for you to be the RT and then you're going to be passing or failing your own x-rays. So sometimes it's pretty obvious that this thing needs to be repeated, other times not so obvious. You know, of course you've got co-workers around so you can ask them, you know, hey, is this, do you think this is passable? And of course I have seen radiographers pass x-rays that I would not want my marker associated with because I, I knew they were poor and the radiologist wasn't going to like it. But, you know, the next guy's got an RT on his chest just like I do, so if he's going to pass that radiograph, um, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. I can gently suggest that maybe it should be reshot, but, you know, that's just one person's opinion. Now, this image here that I'm looking at, this is a lateral chest x-ray. It's a left lateral. Got a marker right here, even though it's kind of burned out, but you can still see what it is. Um, this image came out of the garbage can. Why was it thrown away? Well, okay, if we're taking a look at this thing, first things first, okay, can we, did we clip off the upper anatomy? Now, on a chest x-ray on a lateral, you're not going to see a whole lot up here anyways. It's going to be mostly whited out because of the difficulty of penetrating through both shoulders. Um, but we're not clipped top. Okay, that's good. Okay, what about at the bottom? Okay, did we include the cardiophrenic angles? Yeah, absolutely, they're on there. Um, what about the costophrenic angles? Okay, if we're looking at the posterior costophrenic angles, we can see them. Yep, they're on there, but right here's where we run into trouble. Okay, we've got what appears to be the left diaphragm way forward of the right. So this patient was rotated away from the image receptor to a significant degree. Remember the old rule of thumb and basically your thumb is about an inch wide. If there is more than a thumb's breadth of space between those um, angles, then that needs to be repeated. This thing is, is way too rotated. I would not want to show that to a doctor. Interesting. See this aorta? Everybody's different. Some people's aorta just goes basically straight down through their body. Other people's aorta takes a more circuitous route. Okay, here's another x-ray. Portable, AP. And what do we see on here? Okay, well, do we have the costophrenic angles? Yes. Cardiophrenic angles? Not so much. What's going on here? See where that's all whited out? We should be seeing vertebrae through here, and we can't, which means that tells me that almost certainly they use too low of a KVP on this x-ray because they're just not penetrating this, this um, anatomy here in the mediastinum. Um, but as you can see, uh, there's like tubes and lines in the way. There's nothing you can do about that. You know, those are just like what's keeping the patient alive, and he's got a heart monitor on too. Um, but we have to go back and reshoot this because we have to be able to see the vertebrae through the heart shadow. Otherwise, we're underpenetrated, and you know, obviously, we can see lung markings here, but there's just not enough information there for a doctor to be able to make a good diagnosis. All right, next image. This. Have I got this thing hung correctly? Yes, I do. Right marker is here. Um, oh, there's patient information on this one. I need to get the scissors out and cut that away. But you guys can't see it, but I can. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, this patient, I don't know if they were deliberately trying to do an oblique chest here or not, but it looks like that their patient is definitely twisted. Um, Oh, they've also got barium on board, so I guess they've been having uh, some kind of a study today, like an upper GI or something like that. So, okay, if they wanted to make an oblique shot, they're not oblique enough because they're supposed to be 45 degrees, but if they were trying to do like a true PA, then how was this patient rotated? Well, we can look and we can see these clavicular ends are way off kilter. They um, One's overlapping the spine almost completely, and the other is out here in the left lung field. 
Now, the clavicles are anterior structures. So if this patient is rotated RAO, then that would account for this because this right clavicle is now projected over the spine and the left clavicle is, you know, hanging out here over the left lung. So this patient was rotated RAO. Given that this came out of the garbage can, I doubt that this is what the radiographer intended. Oh, the other thing is this. See these surgical staples here? These are um, basically like stainless steel wire that holds the sternum together after open heart surgery. Um, those, so the, the whole sternum is projected over the left lung also, which means that, you know, again, this patient was RAO. Here goes another. Let's see, this is a left marker, so that is hung correctly. All right, so what's wrong with this image? Well, a couple of different things. Number one, again, we are rotated way too much. See, this right clavicle is over the spine. The left clavicle is away from the spine. That means that this patient was also RAO. But the other thing is this. Okay, we've clipped off the costophrenic angle over here on the left, that's no good. And see how dark it is through here. Okay, so what could have possibly happened? We probably had too much mass. If we would have had too much KVP, then I'd be seeing more even penetration down here, um, you know, through this diaphragm. Could have been too much KVP, but my money is on too much mass. Um, they basically just hit this too hard, and so now these areas of the lung are blacked out, and there's no good information there for the radiologist to use. There could be pathology in there that we've burnt through, and so now it would be very difficult for a radiologist to use that for a diagnosis. So this thing is twisted and burnt and clipped. No go. Okay, this is going into the trash can. All right, let's take a look at this image here. All right, that's nice. Okay, what's going on here? Okay, well, we have very little rotation. Okay, that's good. The clavicular ends are right where they're supposed to be. We've included the apices of the lungs. Okay, that's good. We've included the costophrenic angles. Well, kind of. This one over here is one of those that's like really, really close. If in doubt, go back and repeat it. So we're really close on this angle here, although I suspect that even if we move this patient um, to their right just a little bit and reshoot, I'll bet on our reshoot we don't see any more information than is already here. But, like I said, if in doubt, um, we can see the vertebral bodies through the heart shadow. <clears throat> so that's good. Unfortunately, we forgot to have the patient take their necklace off. So that's a deal breaker right there. There could be pathology behind that heart. You know, not that heart, but that heart. And if it was, if there was like a little nodule there or something like that, the doctor would miss it. So we got to get the patient to take their jewelry off and reshoot. Technique is good though. Um, you know, if not for that heart and not for the fact that we had them off center to the, um, they were a little bit too far to the left. So, you know, we're just too close right there. Now, this one here, let's take a look. Okay, so we've got the apices on. Okay, we've got a marker on there. That's good. Um, do we have sufficient penetration through the heart shadow? Yeah. Okay, that's really, really iffy. <clears throat> we have lung markings, both lungs, and we have the cardiophrenic angles and the costophrenic angles on. Okay, so why did we repeat this x-ray? The only thing I can see that's really wrong with this x-ray is possible lack of penetration through the mediastinum here. I think this is a, a pretty good sized patient. Um, the technologist chose to do it crosswise, so I guess this must have been a pretty good sized man. And we probably used like 100 kVp, and we should have used 120 kVp in order to penetrate this guy. So. You know, keep in mind, big patient, big KV.
But other than that, uh, positioning wise, everything looks to be on there. Rotation is minimal. And here's another way you can tell rotation. See those spinous processes right there, the posterior spinous processes. Those are pretty well centered to the vertebral bodies. So that's good. That's bueno. Okay, uh, last but not least, and here goes a left marker. So I'm going to hang like this. As, remember the, the patient's left goes on my right. Now this is a pretty hideous x-ray. <clears throat> I doubt anybody among you would have passed this. What happened? Well, do we have good penetration through the mediastinum? Yes, we can see the vertebral bodies clearly, like all the way down into the abdomen. So we had enough KVP. That was no problem. Did we get the costophrenic and cardiophrenic angles on? Okay, yeah, there they are. Um, this must have been a pretty good sized patient because again, the technologist chose to use the film crosswise and look how small these lungs are. That's very typical of patients that are obese. Their uh, adipose tissue actually winds up squeezing their lungs so that they're smaller than they you know, normally would be. Now, apices on there, Yes, they are. I can see uh, we're all the way up to T1, so that's good. You know, we got the apices on. Um, but here's a problem. We misjudged the amount of mass we were going to need. So even though this is a big patient, you know, if we have sufficient KVP to penetrate the mediastinum, then we don't necessarily need to shoot this thing with like 25 mass or whatever it was they chose. Um, they really blacked this thing out. Now, if this would have been a digital image, we'd have gotten away with it because the computer would automatically um, compensate for this overexposure in the lung fields well as much as it possibly can. Um, if you hit it too hard, then even the computer can't fix that. But anyways, um, if we had done this on a, a DR system, for example, we probably would have had everything on and we would have had a good picture that we didn't have to repeat. But what would the exposure index look like? Well, okay, if we, had a, if we had an S number, it would probably be low, you know, like 75 or something like that. And if we had an exposure index, it probably was up around like 800 or something in that neighborhood. So if the radiologist looks, he can see, okay, well, this is a good looking image, but I can tell that it was overexposed. So, you know, don't do that. But with film, you don't have any choice. You have to go back and repeat this thing again. Um, there's a good image. See right there? You can see exactly where the trachea branches, and right there's the carina. Okay, so we would have got away with it if it wasn't for that pesky film. All right, I know I said I was done, but I've got one more to go. <clears throat> Remember on your lateral chest x-rays, okay, now this doesn't have too much rotation. See these posterior um, ribs are almost exactly superimposed, so that's good. Okay, so we had the patient positioned correctly. The problem is this. Our image receptor is way too high. You shouldn't be including dental x-rays on chest imaging, so there's no need to put the patient's mandible on here. Um, whoever was setting this up should have noticed that the patient's face was in the light field. And I know this is a little bit of Monday morning quarterbacking, and it's always fun to make, uh, you know, kind of make light of what other people have done. Um, have I ever done this before? Yes. Okay, whenever you're doing a left lateral, um, the thing to do is just move the image receptor and the tube down because there's not going to be a whole lot of good information up here in the, um, in the superior part of the lungs anyways due to all this tissue like we were talking about. You know, it's always just like a white cloud up there. All the good information on a lateral chest x-ray is basically from here down. We want to be able to see the whole heart shadow um, and the aorta, which is right there. Excellent. You know, the doctors are always looking at the heart and great vessels, the pulmonary vasculature and the, um, and the aorta. It's, you know, that's one of the things that they want to see. And we've got the cardiophrenic angles on, anteriorly, excellent. Oops. Okay, because we had the image receptor about four inches too high, we've clipped off all this inferior anatomy. And these um, costophrenic angles have to be demonstrated. 
And the reason for that is because if you can imagine the patient as being like a, a pitcher, and I go to pour water in this thing, if I uh, pour water in here, where's all the fluid going to accumulate? Well, okay, the cardiophrenic angles are a little high, so, I mean, it's possible there could be some fluid accumulation there. But, in all likelihood, any fluid, like uh, pleural effusion or um, uh, hemothorax, whatever the patient's malfunction happens to be, if there's any fluid in here, it's going to pull down here in these costophrenic angles, and so it's imperative that the doctor be able to see that. All right, cool. Now, uh, the next part of our... Um, little adventure is going to be looking at some radiographic pathology so if you wouldn't mind come on down to my office with me and we're going to look at some images okay welcome to my office and now we're going to take a look at some particular chest pathologies um, we won't go over a lot of these in any detail but there are some that you're going to see over and over again that i wanted to kind of make sure you understood what was going on if you take a look at this image here then over in this aspect of the lung, left lung, you can see this doesn't look right, does it? Okay, there shouldn't be this extra area of density right in here. Um, what's happened in this case, this is atelectasis. This is a partial collapse of the left lung. And the way you can tell is because you've got this dense area of tissue here. And over here, a very, very large pneumothorax. And the reason why I know this is a pneumothorax is because it's filled with air. Okay, this is an air-filled space that does not have any lung markings. If you look over here in the left lung area, and this is clipped, you know, so it's not like a perfect chest x-ray by any means, but you can see there's air over here, but no lung markings. And that's kind of the telltale for pneumothorax. There's air, but not lung, because the lung has been folded up. Next image is another case of atelectasis. Okay, this is a pretty crappy image. But over here, we've got an area where the, the lung is collapsed, but it's not got air um, like backfilling the space. So this is a collapsed lung with no pneumothorax accompanying it. It's just um, an area of, it's just whiteness over here uh, without any lung markings. There we go. Okay, and this is a, okay, I bootlegged this image off of Adam, so hopefully they don't get me for copyright infringement. But this is kind of what's going on. Um, collapsed lung, uh, there's been a hole probably put into the um, chest cavity, and air has been able to get in from the outside, or the lung has just collapsed of its own volition. Sometimes lung collapses are idiopathic and spontaneous. Um, especially in people that are asthenic. They tend to uh, be more su uh, susceptible to a spontaneous collapsed lung. Spontaneous atelectasis. Now, what do we do about this? Well, we have to put a chest tube in somewhere around here. And if there's air in there, then we're going to vent that air out. And if there's not any air, what we're going to do is um, hook our chest tube up to one of those water uh, bubbling devices and that acts as a one-way valve and so it lets the it takes some of the pressure off you know if there's fluid or whatever we can drain that out and give that lung a chance to reinflate or we could stick a bicycle tire pump down the patient and uh, you know just blow it up that way I'm kidding that won't work here's another case of atelectasis with a complete collapse of the left lung so the left lung is folded, the right lung is still working normally. Again, chest tube has to go in and uh, the doctor will have to try to get that, um, get that lung to reinflate. And normally they will. Now, this is not a collapsed lung. This is a case of really, really bad pneumonia on the left side of the patient. Okay, so you look here and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, this is all clouded up. It looks kind of like that atelectasis did. But if you look closer, you can see that there's, even though there's a lot of consolidation here, and consolidation just means fluid or mucus, you know, whatever happens to be in there. And we got a lot of that, but we can still see lung markings if we look carefully. So the lung's not collapsed, it's just full of crud. Um, so this patient's probably coughing their head off and very, very sick. And here's another example. Now this patient's got a lot going on. 
Um, over here in the left lung base, you can see there's some kind of disease process taking hold, um, probably pneumonia, and over in the right lung too. But look, see up here in this area? The right upper lobe is folded. So, you know, they've only got a partially functioning right lung. Again, this patient's probably um, having a lot of trouble breathing. This is an interesting case because, okay, if you look on the patient's left, uh, left lung looks pretty good, right? They've got a lot of bowel gas going on down here. But if you look over in this area, um, we've got a, a large area of consolidation, but above the lung looks functional and down below the lung looks functional. So this is right middle lobe consolidation and it's got a lot of fluid in it to where it's actually formed a fluid level. And here it is from the side. It kind of looks like there's a fluid level in the patient's heart, doesn't it? Um, but that would never happen unless the patient was deceased. Okay, now sometimes people that are in motor vehicle collisions, um, like if they have a, a sudden deceleration, like they run into a house or they hit a car that's parked in front of them, something like that, and their body gets accelerated forward, then that can cause a pretty serious trauma to the chest. Um, blunt force trauma due to seatbelt is what it is. And that can cause rupture of the trachea. Uh, it can also cause um, like a punctured lung due to a broken rib. All kinds of stuff can go wrong here. And it can cause this, subcutaneous emphysema. Um, this is where you've got air leaking out of the lungs or out of the trachea and it's uh, and the air is just going into like going under the skin, going into the muscle tissue. So one of the telltale signs of subcutaneous emphysema is if you look over here, you'll see see these striations. Okay, uh, that's the pectoral muscles, and those things shouldn't show up like this on an X-ray. That means that there's air mixed in with these muscle bands, and um, you know course that will resolve itself eventually if we can get the lungs to reinflate and we can fix whatever hole is um, allowing the air to leak out into the body cavity. And this is a CT scan, um, probably not the same patient, but on a CT image you can absolutely see here, okay, we expect to see air in these lungs and in the trachea. We do not expect to see air up here under the muscles and under the skin. Um, so this is a case of subcutaneous emphysema that is uh, really, really bad. And if you look closely, see right there? There shouldn't be a hole in the trachea right there. Um, so that's probably where the air leakage is coming from. And here's a little baby with RDS. This is that condition where the baby is born prematurely and their lungs aren't producing surfactant yet. And so it gives the lungs this cloudy appearance, um, kind of like pneumonia. Uh, this is easily reparable, and you know, provided that the patient's able to get into the hospital fast enough. And it usually resolves in just like a week. Okay, here's a case of right-sided effusion. Now this is pretty heavy effusion, but as you can see, okay, on the left lung, we can. There might be a little bit of blunting down there, but not significant. So left lung looks pretty good. Right lung is only partially functional due to this huge accumulation of fluid down here. So there's your classic blunting of the costophrenic angles that we look for on x-rays. Now here's a little bit, okay, again, I have ripped off Adam. Um, emphysema happens when a patient, and generally this is from like long-term smoking or exposure to uh, chemicals or smoke, you know, whatever the problem was, um, basically the alveoli, uh, they just get expanded and, and they wind up getting weak, uh, you know, due to repeated damage. And the air sacs normally are supposed to be, you know, like fairly tight and um, highly elastic. So whenever they expand, they can contract back to their normal size, no problem. Now, if you just had like a few alveoli that were like this, then it wouldn't be an issue. But if you've got bazillions of them in both lungs, then that can cause serious breathing problems, um, COPD, and uh, people are basically gasping for breath and 
They're on oxygen, but they're still desatted, and they feel like they're suffocating all the time. And if you look on a chest x-ray, here's what one might look like. These lungs are hyperinflated, very easy to penetrate, um, very easy to overpenetrate. Okay, here's a case of somebody with uh, normal lungs, but we've taken a chest x-ray and discovered their scoliosis. So if you look here, I mean, this is just obvious. You can see their uh, thoracic spine shouldn't be shaped like a snake skeleton. Uh, tension pneumothorax. This is something that whenever I was in EMT school, they warned us about over and over again. Apparently, this is more popular in the field than I knew it was. What happens in this case is due to typically some kind of trauma, like falling off a building or getting in a car crash, whatever, um, there's been a pneumothorax introduced on one side of the body, and that pneumothorax has, every time the patient breathes, air leaks out into the lung cavity, and it just keeps building up like a gigantic air bubble in there. And this air bubble um, has caused the patient's left lung to collapse completely, and not only that, but this thing just keeps growing. Every time the patient breathes, more air is getting pumped into this area. And now look what's happened. It's actually pushing the heart and the aorta and the pulmonary vasculature over towards the right. Now, if this isn't corrected, mas pronto, like a paramedic, can put a needle in here and uh, vent that air out and let the you know give the patient some relief. But if that doesn't happen, then the patient's not going to live very long. Tension pneumothorax is absolutely lethal. Okay, here's a case of somebody with tuberculosis. Now, how do we know they got tuberculosis and not just some other kind of crap up here like uh, pneumonia or whatever? Well, we've given the patient a blood test and discovered that they have tuberculosis active. Okay, okay, well, now it makes sense. That's why they've got all this consolidation in this right upper lobe. I was looking to see if this is, is this a lordotic chest x-ray? And I think it actually is. It looks like that um, what they've done is they've either angled the tube or angled the patient to try to get the um, clavicles up out of the way. Okay, now in this case, uh, this is tuberculosis, but it's spread all through the patient's lungs, so it's everywhere. And if somebody has long-term tuberculosis, then they're going to be in a lot of trouble. They're probably coughing up blood with just about every breath. Um, as the disease progresses, it causes more and more damage to the lung tissue, and it winds up causing some of the lung tissue to die. So then you wind up with these areas of um, necrotic tissue. You know, it's just, necrotic just means dead. And so there's all this area of the lungs and they call it caseous material, uh, cheese-like. And the way you would know that is because you did an autopsy and examined the patient's lungs. But on an x-ray, it looks pretty hideous, doesn't it? Okay, now, histoplasmosis. This is a fungus, and this is common to the Ohio and Mississippi River valleys where it's wet all the time and swampy. Um, you know, there's this fungus that's in the air at spores, and if somebody breathes it, now normally you wouldn't have to worry about this, but if you're immunocompromised, then that fungus could take hold and cause some serious issues. And I suppose histoplasmosis could be found pretty much anywhere that there's a swampy area, but most of the time um, it is confined to those river valleys that I mentioned. Uh, COPD. Chronic bronchitis um, or emphysema can cause the um, can cause air trapping. Okay, so over time the lungs, uh, the alveoli become more and more expanded. The lungs hold more and more air volume, but the patient has a worse and worse time trying to move that air volume. They can inhale no problem, but they can't exhale, and so the air becomes trapped. It's stale. It doesn't have any oxygen. So um, yeah, this is definitely lethal. And here's a lateral x-ray, and this is probably like a little old lady from Pasadena looking person. Um, we have these patients come in, and they're skinny and leathery looking, but they've got gigantic chest cavities. And a lot of times that comes from um, like long-term smoking. 
A term that you may see from time to time is BULLA, um, B-U-L-L-A. Now, what happens here is, you know how I was telling you that th those alveoli, um, they expand and they get like way too expanded. And at some point in time, if the alveoli start to burst, then they can wind up causing air to leak into little cavities in the lungs. And sometimes these things are really small. You know, they might just be like one inch in diameter. But in this case, there's a bulla that is ginormous. Um, chronic bronchiectasis. If people have repeated um, bouts of bronchitis, stuff like that, any kind of infection, it could be a virus, most often though it's bacterial, and a, a repeated infection causes a buildup of scar tissue and can cause abnormal dilation of the bronchioles. And sometimes it shows up on a plain x-ray, but it would have to be bad for that. Um, but as you can see, see how ragged and, and large these uh, bronchial passages are? Yeah, they shouldn't be looking like that. This is a bronchogram. This is old school, uh, but it definitely does show where there's, um, you know, bronchiectasis present in this left lower lobe. Silicosis, we talked about a little bit. This comes from typically sandblasting. Um, people that work in metal industry and they do a lot of sandblasting of rust. People that work in shipping, um, trucks, uh, truck maintenance, stuff like that. They're going to wind up having um, this kind of disease if they don't wear a respirator. And that's why OSHA came along and uh, started making everybody wear respirators and uh, and being safe. Too many work-related deaths. Asbestosis you can get from handling asbestos, like you know if you're cleaning up an old building or something like that. Again, this can be avoided by wearing a respirator. Um, the problem is, you know, sometimes you might be working in a building and you don't know it's made out of asbestos, and so you're breathing the stuff all the time. And by the time you figure it out, it might be too late. Anthracosis, black lung disease. Um, this used to affect people that worked in coal mines back when coal mining was much more popular and they didn't have, um, you know, the only respiratory protection they might have is like a bandana that they tied over their face. Um, they didn't have respirators or N95s or anything like that. So they would be susceptible to this lung disease and called black lung disease because it's a buildup of coal dust inside the lungs. And here is a case of somebody with metastatic cancer in the lungs. And there are a lot. Um, I can't even begin to count the number of nodules here. But um, this is referred to as the cotton ball sign. And reason being, because it looks like a bunch of cotton balls in there. But this, is, this patient is very, very far gone. And here's an example of a little baby that's got an ET tube down. And this is why they call us to come and verify tube placement, because the doctors put a tube into the baby's trachea, and he thinks it's correct, but it's not. So he needs to back this thing out a little bit so that both lungs get inflated, not just one. Now here's a partial collapse, and you can see like right over here and right over here. This is a partial lung collapse, and this is referred to as plate-like plate -like atelectasis. Reason being, um, you know, somebody thought it resembled like a little plate laying there. And then this patient, check this out. That looks to me to be air under the diaphragm, like free air. So I don't know what's happened to this patient, but it looks like they got a lot of issues. If that is a fundus bubble, then it's the biggest one I've ever seen. I think it's uh, free air under the diaphragm. And here's a lateral chest x-ray showing a partial collapse of the right middle lobe. And those arrows are pointing to the air. See, this should be filled with, this should be functional lung tissue, but it's not. You know, it shouldn't be whited out like this. And here's an example of somebody with a collapse of the right lung. 
<clears throat> excuse me and we can see once again okay if you look over here okay everything looking nice see all these lung markings and we look over on the right and at first it's like oh, okay well maybe we're just over penetrated but no there's air in here but no lung markings so the lung is folded up it's collapsed and here's another example of tension pneumothorax. Um, this is an even worse one. See, the, the heart has been pushed completely over to the right side of the chest. Um, this patient's in a lot of trouble if they don't fix this um, very quickly. And here is a bad blunting of costophrenic angles. Now, what's going on with this patient? I don't 100% know, but I would assume that this person is pretty obese because this uh, left lung field is really, really small. But I don't know, maybe it's folded up and what we're seeing here is um, consolidation and blunting in the, no? No, I think that's all the lung they've got. Okay, left lateral decubitus. Um, in this case, how do we know it's a left lateral? Well, you just have to take my word for it because there's not a marker on here. Um, we can take a look and we can see that there's the heart shadow right here. Um, but without a marker, it's really hard to definitively tell which side is which. So just trust me. Now take a look here. See this? We've got uh, fluid levels. So this is why, you know, like if a patient's not able to stand up, if they can stand up, then great. You know, we can get a better image. But if they're not able to stand, we can roll them up on their left side. And if there's any fluid in the lungs, then we'll be able to see it. And there it is. Okay, now, uh, what we're told is this patient has cancer of the stomach. And it has migrated via the lymphatic system. You know, the, the, lymph, the lymphatic system, we haven't really talked that much about. What it does is it brings lymphatic fluid and blood plasma that somehow strays out of the capillaries back into regular circulation. And there's a couple ducts in the superior vena cava where the um, lymphatic fluid, and there, there's like a valve, and the lymphatic fluid can flow into the vena cava, um, but blood doesn't flow back the other way. It's actually kind of fascinating the way it works. Anyways, the lymphatic route is one way that cancer cells can travel, and in this case, the patient, this is pretty far gone, and you wonder to yourself, how in the world did somebody get this bad off with cancer? Did they not know something was going on? I don't know. You know, maybe they're, uh, sometimes when people are in a lot of pain, they just take drugs or whatever they can get their hands on to dull the pain uh, instead of going to the doctor. Some people are just scared to go to the doctor. They don't want to go. Okay, now here's a patient that has pneumonia. And this is interesting because if you look right here, see there's like a little tube and it branches um, that's a bronchial and ordinarily we don't see those on an x-ray um, but if there's enough fluid built up in here then sometimes the fluid acts almost like a contrast agent and enables us to see these air passages so this that's why they call this the bronchogram sign because it kind of sort of resembles an old school bronchogram all right, now the next patient, interstitial pneumonia. Now remember, interstitial pneumonia is typ typically caused by a viral infection. And this is the kind of pneumonia that gets into the, um, like the flesh that the lung is composed of, as opposed to being confined to like the bronchi bronchioles or um, those the epithelial tissue. This patient is uh, well and truly involved. He doesn't have too much functional lung left. Okay, here's an example of a lung abscess. This is an area of the lung that's gotten infected, you know, whatever means, probably bacterial, and it's formed a cyst. And so now what we've got is we've got fluid here, like lymphatic fluid and pus, and then there's also uh, gas formed from decomposing bacteria. Um, you know, as bacteria live and die, um, they generate like necrotic gas. And so that's probably what's in this area here, as opposed to just plain air. This is a good image. Um, the, this is a CT scan, axial image. 
patient's got contrast on board, so we can see the pulmonary vasculature. Okay, here's the, the pulmonary artery right here, and then the um, left and right main pulmonary arteries. And right here goes the aorta. This is the ascending aorta. And then back over here is the descending aorta, because we're below the level of the aortic arch. This is something nasty. Here is a solitary nodule, but look at, see how it's got these little fibers sticking out from it? Okay, that thing is a, probably a pretty aggressive tumor, and it's already grown to fair size. You know, it's, it's pretty big. So that's that um, like fuzzy appearance is the, your clue that that is a malignant nodule as opposed to a benign one, which we're going to see right here. Now, here goes a neoplasm. This is just like a, a growth inside the patient's lung. But as you can see, it looks like an egg. It's, um, the edges of it are smooth. So all that is is just like a, I don't know, like a random lump of flesh that's growing in there. And the doctor can probably easily cut that out and get rid of it if necessary. You know, maybe the patient doesn't even know they've got it. Okay, and then here again, this is that cotton ball picture that I showed you earlier. And if you look closely at these things, you can see that they've got little fibers sticking out from them. Um, you know, so this, this is a dangerous situation for this patient, to put it mildly. Okay, now in this image here, I want you to take a look. Um, again, we're, we're looking at an axial CT image, and this is a soft tissue window. So we can see the contrast inside the main pulmonary artery. And then if you look at the branch, the, the left and the right pulmonary arteries, there is a filling defect here. Okay, we should see contrast all in these, um, all in these blood vessels, but we don't. There's an area here where there's no contrast. And then there's a, see, almost like a thread that goes over to the other side. Um, this is called a saddle embolus. This is, what this is is a big old blood clot that sits astride these two blood vessels. So it's just kind of hanging out here in the um, right and left pulmonary arteries. Now, if this thing was to break loose, it could cause the patient some serious issues, and it may be causing them issues already, which is why they're in for a CT today. Pulmonary embolism. Very, very dangerous. Now, sometimes a pulmonary embolism just causes breathing difficulty, but then sometimes a PE is uh, just like sudden death. All right, y'all. Good job. Um, this is just that same image that we saw. This was the, the very first image in the presentation. All right, so y'all made it through my bunch O radiographic chest pathology. So be sure to, if I show you a picture of a pulmonary embolism, be sure you know exactly how to define that thing. I'm kidding. Um, on our next test, we will have some pictures, uh, but, you, but it'll be multiple choice. So you'll be able to figure out the pathology um, fairly easily, I do believe. Anyway, thank you very much for your kind attention. I appreciate it as always, and have a great day.